Welcome back to the show that tells you. You are a quantum computer with free will accessing information about your future through simulated measurement. My name is Justin Riddle, and this is episode 23 of the Quantum Consciousness series. In today's episode, we'll be talking about quantum interrogation, a protocol within the domain of quantum computation where the results of a measurement are acquired without actually making the measurement. By the end of today's episode, we'll ask the question, does simply thinking about doing something acquire information as if you had actually done that behavior? This episode is available on YouTube, and an audio-only version is available on Spotify and Apple Podcast. If you like what you hear today, then please like this video, subscribe to this channel, leave a comment below, or for the audio listener, write a review. Join me inside the mystery of numbers. Come and hop a metaphysical Hey there, my name is Justin Riddle. So I got a PhD in psychology from UC Berkeley. And while I was there, I taught a class on quantum consciousness for seven years. And teaching this class was a lot of fun. I learned so much. And this podcast and series is really an update, an extension, and a further exploration of that material. In my day job, I am a cognitive neuroscientist, and I use electric and magnetic brain stimulation in human participants to learn more about the role of neural oscillations in cognition and psychiatric illness. Alrighty, so today's episode will be about quantum interrogation. So if you're new to the channel, there are a lot of previous episodes, and so throughout my series, I'll be sort of referring back to those key terms used in the episode title. And so if you, you know, want to learn more about anything in particular that I'm talking about today, you can go back to those episodes, and I'll try to create pointers throughout the, um, the video version of this series to kind of point you back to those episodes. All right, so the ultimate background to diving into quantum interrogation is a basic understanding of measurement and superposition. These are two of the three quantum principles that I've discussed in the past. And at the end of today's episode, we'll really just be running under the assumption that your mind is a quantum computer, your body is a digital computer, and what does this mean in the uh, exploration of quantum interrogation, the topic of today's episode. All right, so to give you a, another primer for this episode, the past two episodes, we've been talking about quantization and the quantum Zeno effect. And this really highlighted the central importance of measurement and exploring what measurement really is in the quantum mechanics framework. And so we talked about how measurement is more than just acquiring information, but it's actually creating an action upon a system. So just the very act of measuring changes the system irrevocably. And after that measurement, the system is collapsed. It goes into a superposition of multiple possibilities. And then the measurement collapses that wave function into a discrete space-time reality. And then from that position, it will evolve again out of that point. And in the last episode, we talked about quantum Zeno effect, the idea that if you do near continuous measurements of a system, then the system is unable to evolve away from that initial physical state. And you can sort of lock a quantum system into a more digital physical reality. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about a form of measurement called counterfactual measurement. And the word counterfactual basically means acquiring information as if you had done something or a counterfactual um, thought experiment would be what would it be like to do this thing without actually doing it so what would a measurement be if i were to do it and so in quantum mechanics there's this really amazing property where you can actually acquire information about what would have happened had you performed a measurement without actually making that measurement. So we'll be uh, exploring that today. 
And this is important because the act of measuring is an action. So it's kind of a, a way of saying, can I acquire information about performing an action without actually doing that action because I don't want to disrupt the system. All right, so to illustrate counterfactual measurement in quantum mechanics, we'll be talking about the elizur weidmann dud bomb test. And so I'll describe the components of this setup and then we'll talk about the results of that experiment and then some ways that modern technology might enhance this experiment or update it how it might be used in future quantum algorithms, and then we'll end the episode talking about what this means to the human experience, to conscious experience, and what this might mean for a quantum computer inside of your brain. All right, so what are the components of the elizur weidmann dud bomb test? So what we have are a bomb. And the bomb is sort of a sub-in for really any system that you would want to measure. And so how the bomb works is that there is a, um, a sensor placed on the bomb, and if a photon comes in and touches the sensor, if the bomb is real, then it explodes. If the bomb is a dud, meaning that it will not explode, then when the photon bumps into it, it just gets reflected off of this sensor and it acts like a mirror reflecting the photon at a 90 degree angle. And so now we have a real bomb, a dud bomb. The real bomb explodes, the dud bomb reflects the photon, all right? Now the only other component here is what is called a beam splitter. And the beam splitter that we're gonna use in this setup is a half-silvered mirror. And so what this really means is that you have a piece of glass that has half of it with silver on it and the silver would make it behave as if it was a mirror, and if there is no silver, then it behaves as if it's glass, right? And so we know from our own experience looking at mirrors that light is reflected off of the mirror, and if you look out of a window, the light passes through the window, right? And so the beam splitter is essentially a mechanism or a device where when we send a photon at that beam splitter, it's gonna have a 50% probability of behaving like a mirror where the photon gets reflected at a 90 degree angle or 50% probability that the photon passes right through the half silvered mirror, the beam splitter, and essentially it's acting like a window or just a piece of glass. And what this does is because there's a 50% probability of doing either of these, we can send a photon through and we can generate a superposition of both of these possible realities simultaneously. And now we have a superposition of this photon passing through the beam splitter and being reflected off of the beam splitter. And we have a superposition of both of these possible realities occurring simultaneously. And so what we're gonna do is in this experiment, we're gonna set up a sort of square with an entrance point let's say in the bottom left corner and an exit point in the top right corner. And as the photon enters into this square, it's going to hit a beam splitter. It hits the beam splitter and it gets split uh, along the bottom of the square or along the left-hand side of the square. And it goes into each of these at a 50% probability, right? And then at the bottom right corner of the square, we're gonna have a bomb positioned. And this bomb could be a real bomb or it could be a dud bomb. And if it's a dud bomb, it's gonna reflect off of that, of that sensor. And if it's a real bomb, the photon's gonna go, hit the bomb, explode, and it actually destroys the photon and ends the movement of the photon because the photon is absorbed into the sensor and it acts like a measuring device and the photon is absorbed and destroyed or you know, it's out of the experiment and the bomb has exploded. At the top left corner of the square, the photon that was reflected by the original beam splitter, it's gonna hit another mirror and get reflected. And then the photon coming off of the bomb and the photon coming off of that other uh, mirror following the top path, 
those two photons are gonna reconvene, converge their pathways at a second beam splitter. And that second beam splitter at the top right corner of the square, the photons are gonna pass through that once again. And by photons, I really mean there's only one photon, but the two possible realities of that photon are gonna pass through the beam splitter once again. And then if it gets reflected off of that, then it's going to end up at one measuring device. And if it passes through, it's going to end up at another measuring device. So there's two different measuring devices at the far right corner of this um, setup. And we're going to label those two measuring devices G and F. And if you're watching this video, this will become apparent because I'm going to label each of these stages in the experiment with a different letter. And so G and F are like the final pathways that the photon could find itself, right? Okay, so that's the setup of the experiment. A photon comes in, it gets split into two pathways. One pathway goes along the top pathway without any bomb, and another uh, pathway goes through the, the sensor for the bomb, and then the two, the two pathways reconverge and go through a second beam splitter and then are measured finally after this whole process. Okay, so there's two scenarios. What if there is a real bomb in the pathway attached to that sensor? So 50% of the time, the photon goes right towards that bomb and the bomb explodes, right? So 50% of the time, the bomb has exploded, the photon's gone, and we don't get any measurements at the devices, but we have this bomb that went off, so we know that the bomb is real. Now, if the photon goes through the other pathway, it goes um, and it reflects off that initial beam splitter, reflects off another mirror in the top left corner, and then it hits the next beam splitter, and you know there's nothing to reconvene with it. The other photon pathway is destroyed, and so it behaves just like a normal beam splitter would, 50% probability it gets reflected and 50% probability that it passes through the beam splitter. And so at the final measuring devices, G and F, it's going to get measured 50% here, 50% there. So looking at this uh, real bomb scenario holistically, half of the time the bomb explodes, 25% of the time the bomb does not explode and it ends up at G and 25% of the time the bomb does not explode and it ends up at F. So in the scenario where there is a dud bomb at, at that bottom right corner, now what happens to the photons? And this is where there's some quantum magic happening, if you will. And if you're watching the video version, I'm gonna display sort of the simple mathematics of how this works out. And if you're listening to the audio only, you're gonna to have to either go watch the video or just take my word for it because it's a little too much to just say verbally. All right, so what happens is the photon comes in, it gets beam splitted into those two different pathways, it gets reflected on both of those top left, bottom right corners, right? And because it's a dud bomb, it just gets reflected. And then the photons reconverge and they both go through the beam splitter. Both of the pathways go through the beam splitter. And then there's two more sets of superpositions. And then the full system, you can sort of sum together all of these different possible pathways, right? So you could go top path and then go into the, to the, to the passing through slit, or you could take the top path and go to the reflected slit and then you could go through the bottom pathway and then go pass through or the bottom pathway and get reflected, right? So there's sort of four different scenarios here, but what this, how this works out in, in the scenario with the, with the mathematics is essentially that you have a probability distribution of where the photon is. And what happens is at this second beam splitter, there is what we call constructive and destructive interference, where some of the probabilities are gonna cancel each other out, and some of the probabilities are gonna amplify and enhance each other. And so to sort of give away what happens, 
there is a near 100% probability that the photon is measured at measuring device F. So this is the same trajectory that the photon entered. It's going to exit at near 100% probability. And this is really bizarre because it's going 50% chance either of the beams uh, when it hits the first beam splitter and then 50% chance when it passes through the second beam splitter. So our like common sense intuition says, oh, there should be, you know, more or less randomness at the two later measuring devices. But in actuality, there's this constructive destructive interference pattern and it wipes out the probability of going to the measuring device G and it amplifies going to measuring device F. How does this happen? Well, every time you get reflected off of a mirror, you multiply the imaginary number into that probability distribution. And this represents a phase rotation. And I'm not gonna dive into like the concept of phase right now, but essentially it preserves the overall probability in isolation. But if it runs into another superposition and they get you know, pushed onto each other, you could have these different phases canceling out each other um, and then resetting the probability distribution to be to be zero. So it's kind of a way of of rotating in another dimension, which is sort of beyond just like that classical probability dimension. So what you can do is you can work out the math, right? We have you start off coming in as a uh, pathway A or state A, you split off into state B and C, where now if you've been reflected, you now have an imaginary number added onto you. And then as you get reflected again, you add another imaginary number. And when two imaginary numbers are multiplied by each other, remember I equals the square root of negative one. So when those are multiplied together, it creates a negative number. And so what this essentially results in is that you can have one state, uh, the state that is the pathway going to measuring device G, this will have a negative probability when you finally add things together and the other one will have a positive probability. And so those two states cancel each other out. And I'm kind of abusing the word probability here, but how it works in mathematics is that you take the coefficient associated with each of these different states and you square it and that is equivalent to your probability and so it gets rid of all the negative numbers so the negative numbers you can't have a negative probability right all all events have some positive probability and negativity doesn't make any sense so prior to measurement you can have all these pluses and minuses canceling each other out and then when you do the measurement you square all of the coefficients uh, associated with each of the states, and then you get the actual probability of getting measured here or there. If you didn't understand that, that's fine. Um, basically, the take home message is quantum mechanics is weird, and you can have these constructive destructive interference patterns. And so, with the dud bomb, all the construction and destruction makes it so that you end up at measuring device F with near 100% probability. Okay, so now we have these two scenarios. And if you've accepted everything to this point, there is a bizarre takeaway message here. What is that takeaway message? Well, now let's go look at the dud bomb scenario and the real bomb scenario side by side, and we'll have this strange reality thrust upon us, okay? So now we look at the real bombs. 50% of the time, the real bombs explode. So let's say we have 100 bombs, and on average, if we run this experiment with each of our bombs, around 50 of our 100 bombs are going to explode. Okay, what about the other 50 bombs? What's the state of those after this experiment? If the photon is measured at measuring device F, then, this was the same measuring device that the dud bomb was going to, to end up at, right? So 25% of the time, measuring device F activates when we have a real bomb. And 25% of the time, measuring device G activates if we have a real bomb. 
So 25 of our bombs are labeled G, 25 of our bombs are labeled F, and 50 of our bombs have exploded, right? And this is rough probabilities. Obviously, in reality, it might move around a little bit. So what do we know about these G bombs and these F bombs? So for the F bombs, and I'm now realizing this is like hilariously, uh, I'm not dropping any F bombs in this episode, but with those F labeled bombs, um, those F labeled bombs, we don't know anything about them. They could actually be dud bombs. If we don't know if it's a real bomb or a dud bomb, then we don't know anything about it. It could actually still be a dud bomb. But those other 25 bombs that got measured at G, we know that those are real bombs. The G labeled bombs would have exploded if we were to send a photon at them. And this is kind of wild. We now have the result of a measurement without ever making that measurement, right? We have learned something about these real bombs. We know that they're real bombs and not dud bombs because we got a result of measuring device G was activated and this could not have happened if it was a dud bomb. If it was a dud bomb, we would have gotten F. And so this is sort of a um, bizarre thought experiment. So I'll try to bring this home and I'll, I'll talk about how this has been updated recently and then what this sort of means. But the kind of shocking takeaway is we can learn things about reality we can make actions upon reality and sort of get the result of that action without actually performing the action. And this is sort of a uniquely quantum mechanical uh, result because in the classical world, we don't typically think about um, the difference between measuring and not measuring because in the digital classical framework, Everything is measured constantly. All physical events are, are physical and deterministic. So you have to almost dive into this framework of accepting probabilities and these wave functions hiding behind the scenes and, and underlying reality. And then it becomes very important to think about measurement as an action, as a force that is changing and manipulating reality, right? Okay, so how has this been updated recently? So the unfortunate event here is that we want to learn about these, these bombs. Are they real or are they duds? But we blew up half of our bombs and another 25% of our bombs, we didn't learn anything. And so our, our learning only occurs in 25% of the time. Is there a way to update this dud bomb test? so that we can sort of optimize these numbers a little bit more and we can learn everything that we want to learn without blowing up all our bombs. And so this is called the Xeno Booster. And what you do here is you have a, a uh, rotation lens, and I won't go into these details. First of all, I, I learned about this a long time ago, so I don't remember all the details, but I'll provide links at the end of the episode to the experiments that applied the Xeno booster to the dud bomb test. But the basic framework here is that we wanna send only a very small superposition towards the bomb. Could we send just a micro probability of blowing up the bomb at the bomb? And so what we do is we apply this rotation and then we send only a very small fraction of our possibilities, of our possible paths towards the real bomb. And 99% or 99.9% .9 of our superposition goes on the pathway not with the bomb, right? So what does this mean? It means we're making sort of a very weak measurement of the bomb and we're just sort of sending a very small probability at the bomb and then we're reconstructing our interference pattern to learn if the bomb is dud or or real and what you can do is you can cycle through this this uh, booster multiple times and so you pump this very small superposition at the bomb 
and then you're still counting on this constructive and destructive interference pattern to emerge and you just repeatedly send a very small amount of probability at the bomb and you slowly accumulate information regarding whether or not the bomb is a real bomb or a dud bomb and you do that by minimizing the chances of blowing up the bomb. And so this is where we get into that truly counterfactual measurement, right? Where we previously were able to make a counterfactual measurement, what would happen if I were to measure the bomb, but it was only 25% of the time successful. Here we've created this, this scenario where we can amplify and enhance a very small probability of blowing up the bomb. So reduce the probability of blowing up the bomb, but then still get to have that readout where we can increase dramatically the chance of learning about the state of the bomb, where nearly 100% of the time, um, if it's a dud bomb, we end up with state zero. And if it's a real bomb, we end up with state one, right? So we're trying to push the system towards generating the information that we want to. And theoretically, this is possible. I don't know if this has been conducted in a actual experiment, but the math seems to check out and there's a way to enhance our uh, success in this, in this scenario. A fun thought experiment where you can uh, sort of imagine that the bomb is also any sort of quantum device, right? So the act of measurement is the same act as initializing a quantum computer or measuring a quantum computer. So how this generalizes is that the bomb becomes a quantum computer. And what you can do is then you can replace the bomb with any quantum computational system. And then you can say, what would it be like to run this quantum computer without actually running the quantum computer? Or, you know, maybe I calculated this amazing quantum computation and I want to extract the result of the quantum computation without actually measuring that quantum computer and then disrupting the ongoing computation within that system could I send a counterfactual measurement in and acquire the information of the resulting measurement without actually performing that measurement? And so what you can do is you can create a chained Xeno booster where you take one of these, you know, dud bomb test Xeno boosters and then replace the bomb with a Xeno boosted dud bomb test and you can sort of in a nested fashion chain these together so that you're only running the Xeno booster as the bomb exploding, right? The bomb exploding is you choosing to run the Xeno booster itself. And so you're kind of, you know, chaining these, these events together. I will only run the Xeno booster as a result of a measurement, as a result of the bomb exploding. And so then you get even less probability of blowing up the bomb at the center of all these chains of Xeno boosters. And so that's kind of like a fun, quirky way that you can just keep it, uh, keep it boosted or you can multi multiple boost that, uh, that chain. Okay. So back to replacing the bomb with a quantum computer. So this is why it's important is that no one actually wants to use this to test bombs, right? The real idea here is that measurement is a very powerful action in quantum mechanics and this counterfactual measurement is now sort of a way to create a difference between weak measurement and strong measurement where a weak measurement is maybe only slightly influencing that system or influencing it at a very low probability and yet we can acquire some semblance of the full measurement versus a strong measurement which massively perturbs and changes the system, but we get the full result out from that quantum computation, right? And so there's um, plenty of applications to this. One application is also coming from cryptography. And so I talked about this a bit in the quantum computer episode, but one thing that quantum computation has in store for us 
is a way to update our modern forms of encryption. And so in encryption, the idea is that we use basically um, prohibitively computationally expensive prime number factoring as our primary means of encryption. And this is kind of weird to think about if you don't know about this, but when you have something that's password protected or encrypted, you basically have large prime numbers that you and another person are, are in possession of, and it's really hard to factor um, if you were to multiply those two prime numbers together, it's hard to take that resulting number and then factor it down to those two prime numbers. So this is a computationally difficult, challenging process. And on a digital computer, it would probably take until the heat death of the universe to get the result of that factoring computation. However, quantum computers might be able to break these prime number factoring based cryptography um, algorithms. And so this presents a real challenge where in the near future, all of our passwords and encryption protocols might be obsolete and quantum computers might be able to crack through um, encryption codes based in this sort of um, digital computation practical limitation framework, right? But there's a new way of doing quantum cryptography where you send a photon between the sender and receiver and just by virtue of measurement being a powerful action, you can tell if someone messed with your photons. The photon is gonna end up at the receiver's end, slightly altered by this measurement. The hacker would have to collapse the wave function and destroy the quantum information within the, within the photon, and then the receiver would be able to verify that the quantum information has been destroyed, and so then you can cut the communication transfer between the sender and receiver, and so presumably this is very hacker proof. However, what if you had a hacker performing counterfactual measurements upon the photons that are sending the meaningful information? The hacker is only making a weak form of measurement upon that stream of photons. And so they really don't want the parties to realize that they're extracting this information, the result of the measurement. And so they're applying these very low probability, gentle influences upon the photons. And they don't want the sender receiver to be aware that they are a hacker receiving this information. And so could this Xeno boosted, chain Xeno booster um, like algorithm be a way to intercept these photons and then allow the photons to continue their transmission without being detected that they've been um, intercepted and that measurements, weak measurements have been applied on those photons where strong measurement is going to be protected through the cryptographic um, algorithm, but a weak measurement might not be noticed. It might, it might cause some some gentle influence upon the system, but it might not be enough to notify the, the two parties. So who knows, maybe you'll have counterfactual hackers in the future and then there'll be some other algorithm that counteracts weak measurement or is able to counteract the weak measurement in some way by detecting this weak force. Who knows, um, this is really early days in the quantum algorithm development stages. Okay, so I want to end the episode by talking about what this means for human experience and for having a quantum computer in your brain. And so I'm gonna talk about a weak form of, uh, of counterfactual measurement in your brain, and then a stronger form of counterfactual measurement, which gets a little more esoteric and potentially more outlandish, but fun to think about. So the sort of softer version of counterfactual measurement in the brain is let's replace the bomb with a motor neuron that's gonna activate some, you know, your spinal cord and activate some muscle group to perform an action. So here, the, the bomb analogy is relevant, right? If you're just gonna start activating your spinal cord, there could be really genuine repercussions to that activation, right? 
you might leap in front of traffic accidentally or you trip and fall or you know there's a number of, of horrible things that you can imagine happening through a misfire of of your behavioral system right of your spinal cord so could the brain assuming there's some mechanism for a quantum computational device to be within your brain potentially uh your cells have some onboard quantum computational force look at previous episodes for the biological plausibility of these who knows it's early days but let's assume that this is possible would you want to treat these motor neurons like these bombs what would happen if i were to activate this motor neuron or activate this motor system and you could imagine setting up a quantum computational algorithm in the brain where you're counterfactually performing behaviors or counterfactually activating the neural systems that perform behaviors. And this would be sort of a guarded, careful way in which the brain could simulate or process the results of what would happen if I were to do this. Let me simulate this measurement and get the very real genuine result of that measurement, right? You're not just figuring out if a bomb is dud or, or real, but you're potentially interacting with a quantum computer itself. Replace the bomb with a quantum computer, then replace the quantum computer with a neurally plausible quantum computer, and then different parts of your brain could be counterfactually measuring other parts of the brain and then simulating or figuring out what would happen if I were to do this, what would happen if I were to do that, realizing that by creating these strong measurements, you're creating a physical action within the brain, right? So assuming we are a free will quantum computational system in our brains, the act of measurement is our ability to, you know, sort of enact our free will upon this neural tissue. And so that measurement has repercussions. It has a physical response. And so you want to be really careful where you're applying your own collapse of the wave function. Where am I going to measure this? Where am I going to measure that? And so the counterfactual system could be a way of simulating what would happen if I were to do something without actually making that thing happen. And it sort of hedges you against negative repercussions of different um, physical states, right? So that's kind of a cool way of thinking about counterfactual measurement in a practical system within the brain. Okay, so now what is the stronger, more outlandish form of counterfactual measurement? That is this quantum interrogation notion. And quantum interrogation also applies within the brain, right? It's like you're, you're interrogating a system, you know, are you a real bomb? Are you a dud bomb? The, the quantum terminology comes into the interrogation by saying, are you a dud bomb? Are you a real bomb? But I'm not actually going to check whether you're a dud, of a dud or a real bomb, but I'm going to get the result of that interrogation as if it was a real interrogation where I actually asked the question. So you can imagine that in the brain, different brain regions, quantum interrogating other brain regions, extracting information from this interrogation, but without disturbing the system completely or disrupting it with a, with a chaotic measurement that could be disruptive to the, to the ongoing process. Okay, the strong version, the outlandish version. We are swimming in a sea of quantum co computational beings, right? All things around you are quantum computation. All conscious beings are quantum computational devices. And so as we move around the world and interact with each other, you could think of our interactions as measurements upon each other. I'm a quantum mind interacting with you, another quantum mind. And as I'm speaking, interacting with you in the physical domain, I'm performing measurements and actions upon you, another quantum computer, and that is the nature of our interaction. We're measuring this physical world and we're measuring each other through our actions upon each other, right? Two systems enacting free will upon each other via the physical domain. Okay, 
But if we add quantum interrogation into the mix, I want to interact with you, another quantum computer, but I don't want to actually perform the action upon you because there could be negative repercussions. So what if I were to quantum interrogate another person? There's another quantum system. What would happen if I were to do this action? Let's say that action is performing some physical behavior, saying some words to that other person. What would happen if I were to say this to another person, but I don't want to say the thing to that person because that might disturb the physical reality and irrevocably change my future. If I say this thing to you, I change the future permanently because we live in a single universe. I enact this change upon that physical universe and now it is different. We cannot undo what has been done, right? This is sort of the, the sort of universe quantum framing of collapse of the wave function, right? Add quantum interrogation. Can I simulate or could I interrogate what would happen if I were to do this and then get the results of that back and learn something genuinely from the external world? So this is more than just, you know, some internal process, but I am asking a question to the world around me, interacting with my neighbors and other people, and then getting the result of that as if I had actually done it, but I don't have to do it because there are repercussions to the action. I do it with a micro measurement. There's a very small probability of me doing this. I entertain a very light, soft probability of performing some action by entertaining that light probability and then Xeno boosting it in some form. Who knows how that would happen? Maybe dwelling upon a simulated reality or dwelling upon a possible future in mentally simulating that possible future, do I acquire genuine information from the external universe as if that behavior had been performed? This is the outlandish out there repercussion of pushing quantum interrogation to the limits. Take quantum interrogation, suspend all disbelief. We're all quantum minds you could potentially think your way into accessing real information. Do our thoughts contain the semblance of a small quantum information quantity of genuine information from the world around us of what would happen if we were to do things? And I say genuine here because it's not like I've simulated some little bubble in my mind there's a little model in here and I run, you know, these little characters in my mind. This is the real world. I am actually sending genuine micro probabilities into the world around me and receiving a flood of quantum information that doesn't violate the causal chain of events in our reality. But I acquire quantum information from the universe around me as if I had done that thing. And this would be like amazing and mind blowing, right? What if your thoughts are getting real information from the reality that we live in? That would be the most wild universe that, that you could imagine in a way, right? Your thoughts are genuinely soft interacting with the external universe and then extracting information. Remember, and I've mentioned this in a previous episode, this is not digital information. This is purely quantum information, right? You can't break the space-time causal structure of, of time, right? Events need to have this digital causal chain. But quantum information can travel backwards in time. Quantum information can be acquired without actually performing real actions. And so quantum information is this loophole for how we're able to get more out of reality through different forms of, of quantum weirdness than we could with this hard, physical, reductive form of measurement and, and um, processing of information. So keep that in mind as well. Go about your days. Think about if your thoughts are accessing genuine simulated possible realities. And I'll talk to you again very soon.